reading 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray together. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we worship thee, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the everlasting God, O Lord, thou who art the incomprehensible God, thy wisdom and power and majesty, O Lord, no living mortal can comprehend, but we thank thee, gracious Father, that thou hast revealed thyself to us, that the Savior of sinners, the Son of the living God was made flesh and dwelt among us. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to this earth on that costly mission to lay down his life for his people, for needy sinners. And, O oh Lord, we thank thee for that open fount, for the forgiveness of all our sins, for reconciliation and peace with our God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And, O oh Lord, we come with thankful hearts and rejoicing hearts, thanking thee for such a saviour, for so great a salvation. And, O oh Lord, we pray that as we come in this sacred hour to worship thee, to open thy word, O oh Lord, come by thy spirit and work a mighty work of grace in every heart. And, Lord, we pray especially for those who have not yet come to know thee, to seek thee and find thee. Lord, work miracles of grace. Lord, through those who come online and those who will hear and watch, O oh Lord, and by thy mysterious grace, O oh Lord, may the ministry this evening reach needy hearts, and O oh Lord, that yet more precious souls may come to seek thee and find thee, the living God. O oh Lord, hear our petitions, cleanse us afresh of all our sins, receive our worship and praise. Come now, Lord, we ask by thy Holy Spirit and bless our waiting souls. We ask these things in our Saviour's name and for his sake. Amen. We come to our first hymn, hymn number 216. Hymn number 216. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of cancelled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice. The humble poor believe. Hear him ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ, ye blind, Behold your Saviour come, and leap ye lame for joy. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honours of thy name. We extend a warm welcome to all joining us, and we do pray that the Lord will greatly bless us as we worship Him together. We're very pleased to welcome to our pulpit the ladies of Jason Palace tonight. Our notices for the week our Bibles and your prayer meeting will be at 7 30 pm on Wednesday here in the chapel. Next 
Catholic Lord Savior, and the general people was due to preach at both services, which are at 11 a.m. in the chapel, and the evening service will be an afternoon service at 2 30 p.m. via YouTube live stream. Turning down the word of God to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. <coughs> I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. May the Lord grant us a blessing from the reading of his word. Let's continue with our next hymn based on the 90th Psalm, hymn number 90, version 2. Hymn number 90, version 2. O oh God, the rock of ages, who evermore hast been, while life's brief tempest rages, our dwelling place serene. Before the world's creation, O oh Lord, the same as now, to endless generations, the everlasting thou. Our years are like the shadows on sunny hills that lie, or grasses in the meadows that blossom but to die. A sleep, a dream, a story, by strangers briefly told, an unremaining glory of things that soon are taught old. O thou who cannot slumber, whose light grows never pale, teach us a right to number our years before they fail. And may we find and know thee, thy kindness and thy ways, and thou our guide and friend be, the Lord of all our days. Lord, crown our faith's endeavour with glory and with grace, till clothed in light forever we see thee face to face, a joy no language measures, a fountain brimming o'er, an endless flow of pleasures in Christ for evermore. I'm turning again 
in the Word of God to Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 1, and reading from verse 1. Second Timothy chapter one, reading from verse one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lewis and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. May God grant us a blessing from the reading of his inspired word. Let's pray together. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, Lord, we come to thee, the God who is above all, the creator of all, and the God who is the initiator of grace, in countless souls, O oh Lord, we are reminded of thy mighty condescending love in that hymn, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldest die for me? O oh, gracious Father, we thank thee for thy mighty condescending love, and how can it be, gracious Father, that we who have offended thee and broken thy laws and spurned thee, and O oh Lord, and cast thee aside and live for ourselves with no regard for thee, O Lord, and thou who art the injured party, should initiate grace and mercy for such undeserving sinners. O Lord, we marvel at such long-suffering, such mighty grace. O Lord, we praise thee and thank thee that thou, the sovereign and the everlasting God, O Lord, thou art a God of such tender mercies and loving kindness. And we thank thee, Lord, that this is an age of grace, where thou art calling souls to thyself, thou art calling out thy elect. And, O oh Lord, we, as thy people, we survey the spiritual landscape. And, O oh Lord, we are troubled by the things we see. But yet, Lord, we know that thou art the sovereign God. And, O oh Lord, we know that thou art still calling out needy souls to thyself. And we thank thee for the freedoms we have in this land to continue to proclaim thy truth. But, O oh Lord, we beseech thee that even in these dark days, days of rampant unbelief and atheism and false religion, O oh Lord, we beseech thee that thou would yet 
bless thy truth, come by the power of the Holy Spirit, and bless every faithful minister of Christ. O oh Lord, bless the gospel in countless more towns and cities in this land. Bless thy servants and raise up many more, we beseech thee. O oh Lord, that yet before the end shall come, thou would yet grant forgiveness and pardon and life to many more needy souls. O oh Lord, we pray again for this city. We pray for the inhabitants, so many, Lord, at ease and indifferent to the desperate need of their souls. We remember the warnings in thy word concerning the, the Laodicean church. They were rich. They had everything physically, but spiritually they were wretched, poor, blind, and naked. O oh Lord, that thou would grant spiritual eyes, that thou would open the eyes of many, that they may see their bankruptcy and their desperate plight before thee, the living God, the judge of all the earth. O oh Lord, come by the power of the Holy Spirit and trouble many more people, that they may be found in this house of prayer and many other chapels and churches up and down this land. Grant forgiveness and life to many more souls. O oh Lord, that many more children and young people also may come to see their need of eternal life and that the passing and futile and foolish things that so many people are consumed with. O oh Lord, that these things may disintegrate in their estimation as they see the wonders of thy grace. O oh Lord, have pity in these last days. And even now as we gather, O oh Lord, around thy word and to consider the mysteries of thy wonderful grace, Lord, we pray that thou would work in our hearts and in the hearts of those who have not yet, not yet come to seek thee and find thee. Lord, bless thy word now, we pray. We depend entirely upon the work of thy Holy Spirit. And we bring these petitions to thee, asking all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and for his sake. Amen. Let's turn to our next hymn. Hymn number 263. Hymn number 263. Plunged in a gulf of dark despair, we helpless sinners lay, without one cheering beam of hope or spark of dawning day. With pitying eyes, the Prince of Grace beheld our helpless grief, and he saw, he saw and, O oh, amazing love, he came to our relief. Down from his glorious courts above, he came to earth and bled, entered the grave in mortal flesh, and lay among the dead. He spoiled the powers of darkness thus, and broke our bitter chains. So Jesus freed our captive souls from everlasting pains. Oh, for such love let rocks and hills their lasting silence break, and all the host of ransomed tongues the Saviour's praises speak. O oh, hosts above, assist our joys on heavenly harps of gold, but even with angelic powers, his love can never be told. Please turn with me now in the word of God to the second letter to Timothy, chapter 1, and reading verse 7, just the seventh verse. Second Timothy, chapter 1, and reading the seventh verse. For God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And my title for this evening's message is The Malfunction of the Soul. Now, when you look at this verse, you may think, well, I don't see that subject in there. 
the malfunction of the soul? Well, it is by implication, and I'll, I'll explain. I'll explain what I mean by this briefly. Uh, but first of all, just a brief uh, background information concerning context in which this was written. This was written around AD 67 by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is in prison in Rome, and he is writing a letter to a young pastor called Timothy. And Timothy, um, he writes to Timothy to encourage him because the Apostle Paul is well aware that as a Christian, you suffer for the gospel. And he is really living this out. He is suffering for his Lord. He is in prison for the faith. And he, he wants to remind this young pastor, Timothy, that when you are converted, when you do come to God for forgiveness, God transforms you and he gives you power and he invigorates love in you. And this is, the, this is what really, he really means in this verse to this young pastor. But there is a principle in this verse, um, which gives us, which is applicable to everyone, not just to Christians, but there's a, there's, the, and the principle is this, is that if God gives his children, when I do become his child and he transforms me and he gives me new life in my soul and he gives me these things, uh, courage and power and love and a sound mind, the implication of this truth is these things are severely lacking before I do become a Christian. I don't have a sound mind before I'm converted. I don't have this power described up here. I don't have this courage. And this love is, it's barely functioning. I'll describe, uh, and that, that's a great claim I make. It, it may seem by some to be an audacious claim. That's that's an extreme thing to say, is it not? That people who are not Christians, they don't have sound minds. They, 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 are you saying that we think illogically? Is that what you're saying? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain myself momentarily. But there is, according to this verse, serious soul malfunction before we come to know our creator. Things are not operating as they should. That is the implication of this verse. And it's due to the contamination of sin. Sin infects every part of my inner being. So this verse teaches that when I do come to Christ as my Lord and Savior, and he changes me and puts me on the path to heaven, something amazing happens. It's a miracle. It is a miracle. My feelings, my emotional system, my reasoning faculty, all these things are greatly transformed, they're improved, they're rewired. My soul is resuscitated by God when I come to him for forgiveness. Soul, my soul is malfunctioning. My soul needs repairs. This does need explaining. Well, I believe the word that the Apostle Paul uses here, God has given us believers a sound mind. This, will, this word will assist us. Uh, in our explanation, the Apostle Paul is speaking of a, when he says he has given us a sound mind. The Greek is speaking of self-discipline, a well-ordered, self-controlled, self-disciplined mind. And according, and the implication of this verse is that the sound mind is barely functional before conversion. And that's a great claim I make, but I need to explain myself. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is not telling people, the implication of this verse is not teaching us that we're, we're incapable of making sound judgments. Of course, everyone makes sound judgments, is capable of making sound decisions in my area of expertise, or in my area of studies, or in many of the small things of life and the day-to-day -day activities. Yes, we're capable of making sound decisions and sound judgments. That's not what the Apostle Paul is addressing. But what about the big issues of life? What about the meaning and purpose of life? And what happens when I die? In this department, which is the biggest department, we are completely lacking in a sound. We have no soundness at all. We do not have a sound mind. So in that sense, in a spiritual and moral sense, 
we have no sound mind whatsoever, we have no power, uh, and we have no courage. And I'll explain these things in detail a bit more. So it's completely non-functional. Well, how does this malfunction occur in the soul? Well, I've mentioned earlier, it's due to our sin. We have a serious sin problem. It started at the dawn of creation. Our first parents rebelled against God, and we all do the same thing. It's in us. It's, it comes naturally. Pride, greed, so many things, deceitfulness. This causes, as I continue to sin, um, sin away my years, these things cause spiritual and moral chaos in my mind. For example, my, and this is, this, is self, this is very evident today in society, my emotional system becomes grossly obese so that my drive for gratification and pleasure increasingly blocks out uh, the voice of conscience. And we see this with many people today. Conscience will warn me occasionally, the life that you're living, um, there's so much more to life than this. And many people live like this. They live glued to their devices. They live for such small and pathetic things. They live for such trivial things. The next show and, and the, the top 10 um, songs on the charts, they live for such tiny and minute and pathetic small things. And every once in a while, you may not be a person who's ever entered a church door, but your conscience will still trouble you about these things. Your conscience will still warn you there's much bigger things to live for than these small and puny things that you live for. But we, we brush these things aside. We're hypnotized by so much nonsense. And that's the case with all of us before we're converted. But we completely ignore conscience. Conscience is brushed aside and it's actually silenced. We, we go even further. We silence conscience. We don't want conscience to speak. So in our minds, um, there's spiritual and moral anarchy. It really is like that. Um, I'm sure you remember, it's still fresh in our minds because it's quite recent. Remember last year in America, it seemed like total war. In so many cities, there was so much rioting, cities set ablaze and so many, and you, you wouldn't see any security guards in the shops or outside shops. They wouldn't be there because they, they would risk their lives. They would, it was complete, complete anarchy. It was so dangerous. And spiritually, spiritually, this is what our minds are like before before we come to God. Our, my conscience is silenced, is, con is perpetually silenced and gagged up. So there's no unifying apparatus or something to control the different compartments of my mind, my feeling system, my emotions, my, my will. These things spiral out of control. My feelings, um, there's a great imbalance inside, of, inside me as a person before conversion. Things are not right. My feelings are not kept in check. My worst desires can be easily manipulated and inflamed by dangerous outside forces. Dangerous ideas. And this is what people don't realize. People who have no regard for spiritual, th spiritual things, no regard for God, they don't understand that when they brush aside conscience, really they, it's like someone... It's like a bank, uh, a bank with lots of, or a, a, a very prestigious bank with gold in the vault and all this kind of thing. And imagine a bank with, his, with the doors left open, no security guard, no security code, nothing. Um, people can just walk in there. And at night, the doors are open as well. What, what kind of bank would do, no bank would do that, but that's what we do spiritually. We open the doors to so many hostile ideas. Our minds are just open and people, and, Dangerous and pernicious ideas can enter in at will and can inflame my desires in a direction which is very dangerous. I don't know this uh, before I come to Christ. There's serious malfunction in my soul. No security, nothing. My work, these dangerous ideas can appeal to my worst base desires. And this is what we see in so many lives. People may do great things in life. People may... Um, attain to uh, do inspiring things, maybe 
people do uh, have a Nobel Peace Prize for something good I've done in society, and yet the same person will cheat on his wife and do many other things. Uh, so because there's no control in the mind, I may be able to do, I may be very organized in many areas of life, but spiritually and morally, it's a complete mess. And this is really what the Apostle Paul is dealing with here. There has been, this is just a brief illustration, there have been cases, I saw a documentary not so, not so long ago, where um, the passenger planes, jet liners, these big passenger planes, um, it's quite interesting. I don't know whether you know this, you probably do, but it was quite a surprise for me that these uh, big passenger planes, uh, planes nowadays are almost completely run on autopilot. The pilot, there, there has to be pilots there, but they barely do anything. And you ask yourself, well, what's the point of having a pilot? Well, there's some things they have to do, but the, the computers almost completely run the planes. And there's, there's, that's beneficial, but there's also disadvantages to this, because what's happened, according to this documentary, that there's been instances where the computers have totally taken control and the pilot hasn't been able to do anything. And this, I think, it resulted in two major plane crashes into the ocean where the computers of, um, there was a slight malfunction and they have these sensors outside the plane and they measure the temperature and the, was telling the plane that, that, the, that it was stalling. And when the plane starts to slow down, you have to apparently turn the, uh, it, it's very complicated, but it resulted, it resulted in, in these, in, in two incidents, these two planes crashing into the ocean because the autopilot took a nosedive and the pilot couldn't do anything about it. The, the autopilot would not let the pilot intervene. Well, why, why such an illustration? Because many people live like this. They live on autopilot. They just give free course to their, it's what I want. It's my life. This is my, this is the chief principle for life. It's what I want to do. It's my life. There's no moral, there's no real moral or spiritual principle to life if, if, I'm, if I'm not converted. It's about what I want to do. It's about how I feel. That's the big, huge principle in my life. Do what I will. And people don't realize this. If, you, if that's your attitude and if that's how you choose to live, you're on autopilot. You're not going to in control. I can guarantee it. Your feelings. It's a mess in there. Your feelings are uncontrolled. And you don't understand that you're on an eternal course. You're on a course to eternal disaster if you live like this, if you live on autopilot and you just let your feelings have free course and you do as you please with no moral and spiritual consideration. It's dangerous to live like this. Did you not know that? And this is what this verse warns us about. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we see how vulnerable our minds are we're going to see, I'm going to delve into these, these virtues a bit more and see how our minds aren't functioning properly without these. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now, this is not suggesting all types of fears. Maybe before you come, maybe before someone becomes a Christian, they have a phobia of spiders or, or confined spaces. When you become a Christian, you still might have those fears. So that's not the fear the apostle is addressing here. The fear that he's speaking about is the fear what other people think about you. It's the fear of, it's what the Bible describes as a fear, the fear of man. The fear of man bringing a snare. But whoso trusteth in the Lord shall be safe. It's what the world thinks about you. And many people's lives, whether they're conscious of it or not, they, their lives are governed by this fear dominated by this fear, um, and it's terrible. This, this Satan bullies us by using this world system. He is the orchestrator of this world system, we learn in Scripture. He, he pressures us to think and behave in a certain way. Uh, he bullies us. He, 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 he pressures us. He pressures us, and he steers um, this world system in the direction which is totally opposed to, to God and his standards. And if I do decide to step out of line, if I question these things and I'm uncomfortable with these things, well, the likelihood is I'll be rejected by my peers. I'll be ridiculed. I'll be persecuted. Nowadays, I'll be canceled. All kinds of things will happen to you 
if you go against the tide. Uh, so many people are gripped by the sphere. Naturally, many people adopt a herd mentality. They just go with everyone else. This is how I live. They do not um, question the paradigm. Where is this going? Where is society heading? No, I don't ask these questions. I'm in the grip of the sphere. I have no ethical framework of, of my own. As society changes, so do I. I'm like putty. I'm like Play-Doh. Satan can just mold me however he pleases, and I don't know it. I'm a conformist. And it's strange because people think the opposite. I'm a free thinker. Religion shackles you. Uh, the Bible shackles you into a narrow... No, it's the other way around, in fact. Uh, those who come to Christ, we experience true liberty. Don't be fooled, friends. You live for yourself, and I live for my what I want to do. I live for this world. You will be conformed to think as Satan wants you to think and wants you to behave. This is what the scriptures teach. Conversion destroys that crippling fear which dominates so many lives. And the Apostle Paul is a perfect example of this. Where is he at this present time writing this letter? His second imprisonment. He's awaiting a death sentence in probably a, a damp, rat-infested Roman dungeon. Clearly, he didn't buckle under the, the intimidations of this world. He was willing to die for his Lord and the gospel. What, a, what, a, what courage is this? He didn't have it naturally in and of himself. God gave it to him. It's wonderful to see this. Well, I don't want to be persecuted, you say. Friends, listen carefully. This fear, don't think that you'll, don't think that this fear is, is not so bad. This fear is so dangerous, it's first on the list of sins which will seal the fate of many on the day of judgment. And I take you to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Listen to this. But the fearful, but the fearful, those who fear what other people think, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This fear is dangerous. This fear will seal the fate of countless souls on the last day. But I'm not a murderer. I didn't, I didn't commit this sin. I didn't, um, in, I didn't agree with these things. That, yes, but by being conformed to this age, and by uh, going along with what the world agreed, well, you, even though you aren't a practicer of many, many of these things, you endorse them by going along with these things. But the fearful, friends, are you fearful? Are you fearful of what other people think? It's enslaving. Did you know that? It's very enslaving. God alone can break that fear. But the next virtue that God gives us, he gives us many virtues, only a few, a couple are mentioned here. But the virtue next is power. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. God infuses into us great power of conversion. Power in what sense? Power to live a life which is pleasing to my creator. A power beyond my own. A power over my sins, which I've never had before. Before I become a Christian, I'm just dominated by my impulses and how I feel. And... This is, this is dreadful, and it'll get me into all kinds of trouble. But at conversion, it's altogether different. I'm not perfect. I'm still a sinner, but I'm great. It's, uh, there's such a great difference in me. Sin no, not, no longer has that dominating um, rule in my life. I, I have a new nature, and I'm able to control these things. So it's such a wonderful, liberating experience to know the living God. And... Because God gives me this new power, I'm spared from so many. Yes, I do sin as a Christian. You will sin as a Christian. But I'm spared from so many painful consequences of sin in this life. You think of today. There's so much gossip and backbiting. I know this because I used to work in secular employment. And I used to work in a grocery store. And I used to be in the wages department. And there were managers coming to me and they were stabbing each other in the back and I would just remain silent 
They would be so nice to each other. But as soon as the other walks away, all the knives would come out. And apparently this is rife. It's everywhere. Gossiping, backbiting, arguing, and so much contention, so much there's so much disunity and so much polarization on so many issues, growing hatred, conversion greatly diminishes these things. Yes, I can still, I can, my tongue can slip as a Christian, uh, but when, when that does happen, I'm so convicted, I'm so cast down, God troubles me over my sin, and uh, as a result of this, I'm spared from so much unnecessary anxiety and suspicion and misery and bitterness, the fruit of these evil things. The child of God now has a sensitive conscience. He has power and he's deeply troubled over a sin and that's God's restraining hand upon his or her child. He gives them power and his own almighty omnipotent hand is over each and every one of his children. So in that sense, God gives us power. But lastly, love. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. Everyone is capable of love. But this virtue is greatly improved upon at conversion. Of course it is. Because before conversion, although we had the capacity to love um, uh, our loved ones, and we love other relatives and friends and so on, well, we also love things which are incredibly dangerous before we're converted. We love things which are so harmful to us. We love things which are dangerous and which will eventually destroy us. That's the problem. And that's how so many people are living. They love things which will destroy them. Not just the obvious things like drugs and so on, but people, so many people have, a, have a, such an inflated love or for possessions and things of this kind so that they get themselves into debt. And not just, well, you may not get yourself into debt, but it will cause you so much unnecessary anxiety and stress and all these things. And, you'll be, and it also changes your personality. You love the wrong things. You worship all these idols. It doesn't have to be literal idols, but these idols that I set up in my life. I love these things, and it will change you profoundly. It'll make you more cruel. It'll make you even more inhumane. As it'll make you, it'll take away your humanity. And we see this in society where people live for pleasure and they live for the weekend. Oh, no, I'm pregnant. What an inconvenience. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, deal with motherhood now. I'll get rid of it. Um, you see what it happens, friends. I, I'm sorry to be con so controversial, but it's true. Um, when we love the wrong things, we lose our humanity. Uh, and it's, it, and this all changes, friends, at conversion. Um, love, my love has been corrupted by sin. There is se serious malfunction in the soul. Preacher, how do I obtain these blessings? I hope that's your question. I hope you're asking that question. I hope, how can I be changed? How can I be given these wonderful virtues which you speak of? Well, it's my hope and prayer that you're asking these questions. And, but first, it's critical to understand that these things are given to us. I cannot change myself. I can, you offer, I've often heard people say, I'll come to church when I'm, when I'm a better person. You'll never come to church with that attitude. Um, I can't change myself. I can't make myself fit for God. God has to surgically, I'm speaking spiritually, he has to do the work. But I must be willing to be changed. And I must be deeply and profoundly sorry for my sin. So these gifts are given by God. Power to live a life which is pleasing to him. Power over sin. Love, I now love him and appreciate him. But he has to give me an initial gift first, and that is the gift of salvation. Before God gives me these new blessings and virtues, when I'm saved, I have to be saved first, which is the initial gift. The gift of salvation. What is the gift of salvation? Here's a better question. Who is the gift of salvation? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the gift. He came to this world on that expensive mission 2,000 years ago. Not to us it was expensive. But to God, even to God, this was a costly mission. God the Father, there is one God, but yet mysteriously there are three persons in the Godhead. And God the Son left his throne 
2,000 years ago to deal with our serious problem of sin. And I need to see myself in that state. I need to see myself. I need to see that there are serious problems within that I cannot deal with myself. The selfishness, the greed, the betrayal, the many other sins I'm guilty of, my indifference to my creator, my ingratitude to him. The list goes on. These are serious things. And I need to be troubled over these things. And it's only when I'm troubled over these things that I realize how great and how profound God's grace and love is that the creator of the universe in the person of Jesus Christ should bleed and die on that cross 2,000 years ago. The physical sufferings were great. The bleeding and the, the execution, the crucifixion, how painful it was. And yet he was experiencing also with this pain the far greater, infinitely greater pain of bearing our sins, the spiritual agony he was suffering on that cross as he literally bore my hell. He didn't go into hell physically, but he bore my hell on that cross if I come to him for forgiveness. So my friend, my appeal to you this morning, this evening is seek the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're troubled over these things, come to the, or even if you're not, I pray that God will trouble your heart and you'll see your need of the Savior and his mighty forgiving love. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. While we were yet sinners, he hung and bled on the, on the cross for us. And once I repent of my sin and I trust in him, I trusted 2,000 years ago when he was dying on that cross, he had me. He was thinking about me. He did it for me. That's the attitude you must have. Lord, forgive me. I've been such a wretch. Put me on the pathway to heaven. Friends, you pray to the Lord in your own words, but believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. And God will mightily bless you. He promises to do so. If you're sincere, he promises to change you wonderfully. Put you on that pathway to heaven. Inject such peace and happiness and joy into your soul. You won't be delivered from all the troubles in your life, but God will be with you in the troubles. And he will so bless you and sustain you and guide you. It's the wonderful testimony of Christians. It's an imperfect life because I'm still a sinner, but it's a vastly improved life. But at last, perfected in glory when I see my Savior as he is. So, friends, your soul needs repairs. So come to Christ this evening. Come to him as soon as you can. Today is the day of salvation. Come to Christ for renewal, for liberty, for everlasting life. Amen. Let's come to our last hymn. Hymn number 416. Hymn number 416. Physician of my sin sick soul. To thee I bring my case, my raging malady control, and heal me by thy grace. Pity the anguish I endure, see how I mourn and pine, for never can I gain a cure from any hand but thine. I would disclose my whole complaint, but where shall I begin? No words of mine can fully paint the picture of my sin. It lies not in a single part, but through my life is spread with deep corruption in my heart and evil in my head. It makes me deaf and dumb and blind, disfigured, weak and lame, and over clouds and fills my mind with folly, self and shame. O oh Lord of mercy, hear my cry and set my spirit free. Thou wilt not let a sinner die who longs to live for thee. Let's pray together. Our great and our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, O oh Lord, what manner of love is this, that thou should redeem to thyself a great host of needy sinners which cannot be numbered, and bless them and forgive them, 
and bear the punishment upon thine own shoulders through Jesus Christ the Savior. O oh Lord, we marvel at such loving kindness and grace to such undeserving wretches like us. O oh Lord, help us to, by the Spirit of God, help us to see ourselves in this light of those who are in great trouble. O oh Lord, take away the mirage of our own goodness and the things which we are proud of. And Lord, help us to see ourselves as those in great need of thy forgiving love. O oh Lord, visit us even this evening with thy salvation. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.